Hello everyone, Alex from Lakey Wargames here, and welcome to today's tactics video. Today we're going to be diving into the start of our Nighthaunt Tactica. This range of videos will cover everything all Nighthaunt and of ghostly goodness. However, before we jump into an in-depth look of each unit and war scroll, I wanted to take a step back and go over all the things the Nighthaunt do well and not so well as a general faction. These points are always great to know whether you're playing as or against the Nighthaunt and relate to each individual unit and more importantly how your army will play as a whole. So it's always great to go over these little pros and cons before going into each individual unit and more advanced tactics. I would also like to say a big thank you to everyone from the Nighthaunt Facebook group who have provided all the pictures you will see throughout this video and within the rest of the Nighthaunt tactics videos. I'll leave a link to the Facebook group in the information section below I highly recommend if you're interested in anything to do with Nighthaunt to request to uh, join the group there and uh, join in with the daily discussions and general hobby goodness that goes on on the Facebook group. So without further delay, let's jump into the pros and cons of playing Nighthaunt. First up, let's look at some of those pros. There are a few key things that the Nighthaunt have built into the army that can really make your force stand out against the other armies of the mortal realms. The first of these are your speed and movement tricks. Nighthaunt armies are exceptionally known for being where they want to be, how they want to be there, and when they want to be there. This makes them extremely hard to engage on anything but their own terms. The reason for this is everything in the Nighthaunt book has a relatively good movement. Foot-based heroes and basic troops like your chain rasp hordes and spirit hosts are movement 6. The more key elements to your army like your Grimgast reapers, Blade Geist Revenants and Mormon Banshees are movement 8, and finally your cavalry and mounted heroes clock in at 12 inch movement, with the biggest mover in the army being the Black Coach at 14. Sounds pretty reasonable. Will you couple this movement speeds with the fact that everything in the Nighthaunt army can fly? You're no longer bound by having to move around terrain or other units. Something like a line, line of sight blocking building that can't be moved through? No problem, just fly over it. The enemy has left a big space between their frontline fighting troops and their backline missile units? Just fly over the frontline and charge into those squishy archers. And if you really want to ramp up a unit speed, you can always take a relic, Pendant of the Fell Wind, which adds 3 inches to the normal movement of all Nighthaunt units wholly within 12 inches of the bearer. Now you have 15 inch moving flying cavalry. That's a perfect flanking unit or early objective grabbers. Don't forget that when you want to retreat out of combat, you can also fly over the unit you're engaged with as long as you have enough movement to make it far away enough from the enemy units. This could help you in further turns depending on how the battle is going, such as retreating over a unit to then lock up that unit you retreated from with something else, and then the unit that retreated in that turn can then go on to wreak havoc in the back lines. Now, Nighthaunt don't only just have the ability to shift and move really fast on the table, fly over stuff and do all that kind of good shenanigans, but they can also teleport onto the table to deliver blows to the enemy from all over the place. There is a built-in allegiance ability called From the Underworlds They Come, and for every Nighthaunt unit you deploy on the table at the start of the game, you can hold one back in reserve. Then at the end of any movement phase, before the fourth battle round, you can bring on one of these units from reserve anywhere on the table as long as they are more than nine inches away from enemy units. Now this gives you some real tactical flexibility because not only do your units zip around the board super fast, fly over everything and just wreak havoc where they want, but you can now also just keep something in reserve, keep your opponent kind of wary of what are you going to be doing with that unit, but then you can bring them onto the table kind of, you know, in their back lines or on an objective or even just, you know, keep something off the table they're thinking about it, you know, you're kind of playing those mind games and then you could just bring it onto the back of your table just to hold your own objectives while you push something forward. It really keeps them concerned about the units you can bring onto the table as well as the ones you already have on the table. So it's good mind games as well. The second pro to the playing the night haunt would be your survivability. Now, this is something they're pretty famous for. I mean, being an army of ghosts comes in pretty handy when someone tries to physically hit you and thus makes you harder to kill. In a Nighthaunt army, everything is ethereal, which means you ignore your save modifiers, both positive and negative. 
it's really super handy against armies with high rend as it unaffects you and you're always going to get your save. The army also has a built-in 4-up save on every single unit apart from chain rafts, which mean on average you're going to ignore 50% of all basic damage that comes your way. In addition to that 50% save, you also gain a 6 plus save after that if you fail your normal armor save as long as you're wholly within 12 inches of a Nighthaunt hero. Now that is a lot of saving power. In addition to this, there is also tons of regeneration and being able to bring back dead models within your Nighthaunt army from spells and abilities. Unfortunately, that isn't all sunshine and rainbows, but we'll touch on that a little bit more later. Your third pro is your hero, your heroes and your buffs galore. The Nighthaunt army is only as strong as the heroes you bring. In total, there are 21 unit entries within the Nighthaunt army, and 11 of those are your leaders. These heroes are all really powerful in their own ways, and each one can turn the tide of the battle as they buff your on-surface normal ghosts into killing machines. The reason this is great is because this is where the real power of your unit lies, in the buffs they receive, meaning you get to choose which units you turn into almighty powerhouses, and you can really turn up in really turn up the heat and cause all kinds of problems for your enemy where beforehand they thought they had it easy fighting the exact same unit but without their buffs all of a sudden you can put buffs onto the unit and the element of surprise can be a beautiful thing. The fourth pro to a Nighthaunt army is you are really heavily dishing out mortal wounds. A lot of, uh, a lot of units within your Nighthaunt army have the frightful touch ability and when you're rolling to hit an unmodified roll of a 6 automatically causes a mortal wound. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, you don't get to inflict the mortal wound and the damage afterwards, but this is still great. I mean, for example, spirit hosts get 6 attacks each, they hit on 5s, wound on 4s with no rend and 1 damage, which means 50% of the time you're rolling to hit something, you're going to cause a mortal wound instead of just a 0 rend, 1 damage wound. And like I said, this goes across a lot of units in the army. You get characters like Lady Orlanda, who can cause so many mortal wounds at a moment's notice with her abilities. It's just frightening for your tough enemy troops that don't have saves against mortal wounds. I find a great example is Nurgle Blight Kings. There's something that to a Nurgle army is really expensive and a key element to winning their games. And you can watch those elite troops just melt from the pure amount of mortal wounds you can pour onto them. The fifth and final pro I find to playing Nighthaunt is they are hard to battle shock. One thing that happens a lot in Sigma is units tend to get hit really hard across the board and then they get hit really hard again in the battle shock phase as they just physically can't hold on and they just watch as many units died run away again at the end of the turn. Being dead definitely has its advantages for the Nighthaunt and this comes in the way of not being so easy to battle shock. The reason for this is every character has a bravery of 10 in the book, bar the Chain Rasp Hordes, again, who are only 6, but even these guys gain bravery 10 as long as their unit number is 10 or more. If they do drop below 10 models though, probably meant they were in trouble anyway, so you pretty much have bravery 10 across the board in this whole book. So it kind of feels good because if you do have a really bad engagement and you take a lot of losses, chances are you're not going to take a heap load more losses from uh, from the battle shock phase but you have all that regeneration ability and the ability to bring your models back from the dead so even if you do have a tough round and the battle shock doesn't go too great you've got a chance to bring you guys back in your following turn anyway the fifth the uh, sixth sorry point and uh, kind of like a bonus point really because it's not really tactically related but the night haunt range does boast some really beautiful models all the way from the heroes down to your basic troops and even the centerpieces like the black coach are just incredible really really good models so not only will you have a you know a really good looking army on the table that can fight and hold its own but it will look stunning as as it's going across the table that brings us to the end of our basic pro section for the night haunt and we're going to be looking at some of the cons now Thankfully, this list is much shorter than the other one. 
So first up, you need your heroes. So in the pro section we highlighted how great the Night Haunt heroes are, but they can turn a unit's performance from sort of a 5 or 6 into a 10 in a matter of seconds like we said, but this is also one of the big cons to Night Haunt, because your units aren't naturally amazing on their own. And without the heroes to support them, you often find yourself outclassed in 1v1 fights against other armies whose units don't necessarily need to be built around abilities and buffs from heroes or other support units. So you can find some of your units a bit lackluster. For example, Chain Rasps are really great if you kind of buff them up, but it does require sort of two to three heroes minimum to make them into a, a kind of a fighting machine. And unfortunately, without those, you kind of find they, they feel a bit under par. And if you are fighting something, say, I don't know, uh, Empire Great Swords, for example, then, you know, you're going to really feel the difference because those Great Swords are just kind of good on their own. Yes, they can be buffed to be made even stronger, but they're good on their own, whereas Chain Rasps are kind of a bit pants. And then uh, you can turn them into a really good unit, but you do need your buffs. And this goes for all, our, all, all the units in the book. Even your Grimgrass Reapers, probably the MVPs of the entire book. But again, they do need buffs to sort of make them into those real powerhouses. The second con to the Nighthaunt uh, army is the heroes aren't the toughest. So again, those heroes, everything revolves around the heroes. But the heroes themselves don't boast that much survivability. Yes, they are ethereal and they have awesome ways to self-heal themselves and possibly even heal each other from the Nighthaunt spells. But most of them, and even the biggest, baddest heroes in the book, only have seven wounds, and they do cost sort of 200 to 300 odd points each. And they, you know, that seven wounds, even with a four up unrendable save, on average, I mean, not including the six up save, you're going to be looking at 14 wounds of damage, and you're dead. So it's probably going to be about 15 or 16 wounds worth of damage, which, if you're fighting a horde army, isn't that hard to put on a hero if they get caught out and they take a lot of damage in one turn you're going to start dropping heroes and unfortunately when your heroes start to drop you lose the buffs which make your units not so strong and uh, weaker units equal losing fights and it all becomes an uphill battle from there so unfortunately with the heroes not being the toughest and you really rely on those heroes you can find it of a bit of a struggle the third con to the Nighthaunt army is isn't such a bad drawback. It's uh, you know it's kind of a spoil spoil one, but there is so much choice. Now it's kind of like saying you have too many video games to choose from or too many places to choose to go on holiday, but you know, like I said, there was 21, 21 units in the entire Nighthaunt book, and eleven of them are leaders. In a two thousand point game, you can only bring six. There are a couple of heroes in this book, which when we go through the in-depth tacticas, you'll find that you really, really need. So you find most of the time you've only got choice for extra of about two, three heroes. And that's before you even think about allies. And uh, the heroes really dictate what kind of list you can bring. Because certain heroes are only good at certain roles. So if you bring the wrong heroes with the wrong kind of units in the list, then you'll find you may struggle to uh, get units doing what you want them to do. It's kind of like trying to dig a trench with a pitchfork where you'd be better off with a shovel. It's, it's that kind of, you know, again. But there's so much choice in the book, it's great because it gives you that flexibility and, you know, it gives you the choice to do what you want with your army. But at the same time, because there's so much choice, it can make it hard to figure out what you want and who you want to do what. And the fourth sort of bonus one to complement the sixth one is, yes, the Nighthaunt do have an amazing, amazing range of looking models, and they are really stunning when they're all on the table together, but they are fragile. Unfortunately, a lot of the Nighthaunt models are very, very breakable, very flimsy. Um, there are ways to support them with a bit of conversion and uh, a bit of work on them, but you do have to be careful. Lady Olander, again, being one of them, anyone who's ever built her like I did with mine, I'll put the picture up just now, um, didn't didn't su 
sort of, sort of support her uh, cape just there. She is really wobbly. You put her down on the table and you don't even have to touch the table and you can see her wobble. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, thankfully, mine hasn't broken yet, but I have seen some horror pictures on the Facebook group and it's a very sad day. So, you know, you've got to be a bit careful with your models. Yes, they look amazing, but they are kind of fragile, unfortunately. And uh, that's it for the basic pros and cons and this first tactics video in the in the series. We're going to go more in depth next time and we're going to start getting more advanced with our tactics. Like I said, this is kind of just a, a basic overview and gloss over to kind of refresh and something we can draw back to the main pros and cons, things that we've got to look for in the army as we're going through. Thank you again for taking your time to watch and listen to this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it, subscribe for more videos like this, and comment down below your thoughts. Did I miss a good pro or a good con? Do you agree or disagree with anything I said? I look forward to seeing you all next time when we dive into a detailed tactics video. So until next time, have a good night and happy wargaming.